Thanks, Rich. Yeah, let's get started. And thanks, everybody, for uh, joining here uh, this week, the second part of our grain marketing series. So I don't know where everybody's logging in from. I know Dan mentioned uh, some rain in western Kansas, but here in Manhattan, we've got just about a made-to-order spring day. So hopefully wherever you are, you've got something similar and, and can get out and enjoy that. But what we want to do, well, yeah, I guess in way of introduction, I'm Brian Coffey. I do uh, some of our undergraduate teaching here in uh, the Ag Econ department and then also uh, research and um, look at some, some outreach work on risk management, futures and options, those kind of things. And so that's what I'm here to do today. The, the first little segment here that I'm going to go through, the purpose is going to be to define options on futures contracts take a few minutes to be sure we're on the same page about what those are, and then walk through um, the mechanics of how a corn producer would use um, options to hedge against price risk. So that's where we're headed. And like Rich said, type the uh, questions into the chat box and we're happy to work through those here uh, as we get, get through the presentation. All right, so uh, first of all, Let's go back and just remember that a futures contract, when we're talking about a, a futures contract, that, that is a legal agreement and it gives you an obligation to provide or accept delivery of a very specifically defined amount and quality of a commodity, right? And so if I'm accepting delivery, then that's what we usually in shorthand call buying or going long, right? Because so, so I'm entering into this agreement that says I, I'm willing to accept that. And then if I have to deliver or provide, then that's what we know we call selling or having a short position, right? And so that's kind of the terminology there. But the point is a, a futures contract is defined by a very specific commodity an expiration month, and then the position that you take either long or short. And it's an obligation. You must either make good on the obligation of delivering or accepting delivery, or you have to offset your position, right? So it's an obligation. Now, an option on a futures contract gives a little bit more flexibility. And so one thing to mention is that an option is always tied to a specific contract, right? So a contract of a commodity specific expiration month, but it gives you the right to establish a position, not the obligation. All right. So an option on a futures contract will be tied to a specific contract. And again, that, that when I say specific contract, I'm meaning the uh, both the, co the commodity and the expiration month. And then uh, whether or not I have the right to establish a short position or a long position, right? So if you jump into a futures contract, you're either long or short, um, and that's an obligation with the option, you can establish a position or you can choose not to. Now, this flexibility isn't free. And so to have this option on a futures contract, you pay uh, a premium and you choose the position at which you can establish your position. And that's what we call a strike price. All right, so we've got several prices floating around here, right? We've got the futures contract price itself. We've got the strike price, and then we've got the premium. So we've got kind of three things floating around at the same time, and we want to keep those straight. So probably a way to do that would just be to, to have an example. So one thing that I could do out in the market is I could go out and I could buy a $4.50 call option on December 21 corn. All right, so the December 21 corn contract is that specific contract that's for number two, 5,000 bushels of number two yellow corn and quality defined a certain way that expires in December, All right? So that's the, that is the um, contract the call option gives me the right to establish a long position, all right? So I can't establish a short position, but I can establish a long position because it's a call. And then the $4.50 strike price means that's the price at which I can establish that long position, all right? So we go out, we find the strike price of 450. The call option says 
long, you have the right to establish a long position. And then that's on the December 20, uh, 21 corn contract. All right. And then the premium is what I have to pay for this right. Okay. Now, um, as we go through uh, the life of the option, right, the, the first thing I would mention, and we'll mention this again, is once you pay the premium, you basically think about that premium as being gone, right? That is a cash exchange. So, uh, you know, in your, your broker account, it's not going to be an equity uh, addition. It's a cash exchange, right? You actually pay it and it's gone. And then once you hold that option, basically three things can happen. The first is that option can expire and you can never take, you can never exercise your right to establish a long position and the option just expires, goes away, worthless, all right? And this is actually the, the overwhelming majority of options just because of the way we have so many strikes out there. This is what happens to most options, right? And you can think about why this would be if the futures price out there in the uh, market is lower than my strike price uh, for a call option, for example, I don't want to go out and establish a long position above current market price, right? So if that's, if that's where prices are, I just hold on to the option, do nothing, and it expires when the contract expires. The second thing is maybe I look at the, the futures market price and I say, well, this could make sense to exercise my option. And so what do we mean by exercise? So let's go back to our 450 call on corn. So I have a right to establish a long position in the December corn contract at $4.50. Well, if, corn, if December corn is currently trading at 460, then I could say, okay, I wanna exercise my right. And so now I get a, uh, long position at $4.50. Okay, so now I have a futures position. My option goes away and I now have a futures position, right? And that's an obligation. So I'm long at $4.50. I can go out at the current market, which we said was at $4.60, and I can offset my position at selling at $4.60, right? So I bought low, $4.50. I sold high at $4.60. I can make the 10 cents a bushel there. So if I see that it's profitable, I can do that. That's the second way that this can, this can work out. Last one is that I can always sell back my option. All right, so as, this, as, as the option goes toward uh, expiration, the premium will change, right? And so as the print, but whatever the market premium is for a $4.50 call on, um, December 21 corn, I can always sell that option back. All right. And so you can look at the premium and, and you can think about how that would compare to exercising. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's a way that that options can end up. So basically expire worthless, get exercised or sell it back. Okay. All right. Now, as we said, the option premium is a one-time fee, and I think the best thing you can do about that is when you budget, when you think ahead, you think about that premium as being gone, right? And the, the terminology premium kind of helps me because we talked about insurance premiums the same way, right? I pay my insurance premium and I use it, I use my insurance if I need it. If I don't use my insurance, that's fine. I had it in case I needed it but the premium's gone. So I would recommend the same mindset and accounting with option premiums as you're, you're looking forward is just plan on that premium being gone, all right? Now, what determines option premiums? This is a big topic, but I do think that getting a couple of the basics in mind is helpful. And so basically we've got two things, two big categories that drive um, the option premium. First is intrinsic value. All right, and so that just means if I exercise that option, what's the profit that I could get, right? What's the return that I could get right away by taking my futures position and then offsetting out in the current market, right? And so whatever that is, is going to be bid into the premium, right? It's because these markets are working that way. If the intrinsic value is higher than the premium, then you could just buy options all day and make money, right? But, but we can't do that. So, that, so the intrinsic values bid in. 
The other thing that drives the size of the premium is time value. And so, uh, oh, let me, let me just, yeah, I got a little ahead of myself there. We, we don't ever think about negative intrinsic values. Basically we say, uh, even though you are perfectly allowed to establish a uh, futures position with your, your option that would cause you to lose money, basically we're saying nobody wants to do that right? So you don't have to. So nobody's going to go out and exercise an option that results in, a, in an immediate loss. So we don't think about intrinsic values being negative, but we do think of it, if it's positive, then it's going to get bid into the premium. The other part of the premium is time value. And put very simply, the more time that you're holding an option, the all else equal, the higher the probability that markets are going to move uh, in favor of that option, right? So if you're holding a call option, all else equal, the longer time you hold it, the more, the higher the probability that prices might go up. And so somebody else has sold you that option, right? And so you're, as, as a purchaser of the option, you get paid if the market moves in, in your favor, but the seller is on the opposite side, right? So they're taking on that risk and for taking on that risk over a longer time period, they have to get paid more, right? So, so the time value matters. Uh, the, anything that's, that's going on that makes price, futures price uncertain, increases the volatility of futures price, then that's going to increase the premium. OK, so those are the two big things that are driving um, option premiums. And then you're going to see options described in three ways. And so the first one is in the money options. And so in the money options just mean that I could go out and exercise that option and, and I could it would pay off right now. Right. Doesn't mean that. Um, it has to be, it doesn't mean that it would be profitable necessarily. It doesn't mean that the return I get from the futures market would outweigh my premium, but it means that, uh, for example, in the case of a put, that the strike price is above futures price, right? That I could exercise my put, have that short position, buy back at a lower position in the current market and get some return, okay? Um, at the money just means uh, the strike price is exactly at futures price. And so if I exercised, I would break even. Now, a lot of times in the real world, we don't even see an exactly at the money uh, situation because our strike prices are, are on even numbers, right? And so there's nothing that says futures price has to land on a, a round number, not even numbers. Um, so there's usually a little bit of difference. So at the money is kind of a more approximate idea. So when uh, a strike is approximately the same as the futures price and that's at the money and then out of the money just means no intrinsic value. So when you see these kind of terms thrown around in the money, out of the money, at the money, that's what we're talking about. We're comparing to um, com comparing the strike to the current futures price. Um, now this is kind of a big table for PowerPoint, but uh, I wanted to put it up there and you, you've got access to these slides, so you can go back and look at it in detail later. But this is just some examples of CME grain contracts. There are more out there. And then there's a link there at the, in the note for that chart that gets you to a CME self-study uh, PDF file. And CME has great educational materials, and a lot of them are no pay, like this uh, PDF. They're well-written, they're very short, brief. Um, and, and so I would, I would recommend looking at that if you want to dig into hedging with futures and options a little bit deeper, that would be a great place to start. Um, like I said, there are other contracts. For example, CME offers a mini, M-I-N-I, -I, mini corn contract and a mini soybean contract. And each of those are a thousand bushels. So, you know, if you had one or two thousand bushel that you needed to cover, uh, and you, you didn't want to didn't want to go the full contract, then you could look into some of the mini offerings. But anyway, those are out there. We won't walk through the table in detail, but this gives you gives you some idea. Uh, one thing to notice here is that since these uh, grain contracts are deliverable, that they expire right before contract month. So the December contract is going to expire approximately end of November. 
So when you're planning your marketing and those kind of things, understand that, that you've got a, a, about a one month, it depends on the way the calendar works out, but you've got about a, a one month um, window there, right? Where the futures contract is on the board, but the option isn't. So, so plan accordingly um, for, for using the options. All right, so I think that the best thing to do with that quick uh, background is just to walk through an example. All right, so we're gonna say we've got a corn producer that wants to use options to hedge against price risk of the sale of corn. All right, so what do we need to know? Well, we need to pick a contract. All right, so which futures contract best matches when I wanna market my grain? Do I need a put? Do I need a call? Uh, how many options do I need to cover my position? And then what strike price is appropriate? All right, so these are kind of the, the check boxes you're going to go down. If you're going to use an option, these are the decisions you're going to have to make. All right, so we're going to say that this is at planting time or, or maybe right after planting time, something like that. And we're selling uh, corn, uh, new crop corn, right? We're going to sell corn after harvest. So that means the December contract is the one we need. And we're going to sell we're going to, we're hedging the sale of corn, right? So the, the concept is exactly the same as when we're hedging with futures contracts. We basically want to do the, we want to do the opposite in the futures market that we're doing that, that we, I'm sorry, we, let me try that one more time. We want the opposite position in the futures market that we have in the cash market, right? And so when I'm hedging, I go ahead and sell futures right now. So I'm short, um, futures. I'm planting my corn, so I'm long corn at planting time, right? I'm expecting to have corn. And then at, at, the, at the time of sale, I offset my futures position by buying, and then I sell my cash corn, right? So we're, we're always equal and offset. Well, the same logic with an option, except this time I just want the right to establish a short position, right? I don't go ahead and establish the, the, the short position, but I have the right to. So that's why I need a put. And then we'll just make this easy. We'll say I've got 5,000 bushels of, I'm planning to sell 5,000 bushels of corn. And that means one option, right? One option covers one contract worth of corn. And so that's what we need. And then the strike price. So if you go out to the CME board, uh, you're gonna see all kinds of strike prices. You can't just choose your own, right? I can't go out there and pick a 452 and a half strike price for corn. They're on round numbers. And uh, what you'd have to do is go out and pick the one, the, the combination of strike and premium that makes the most sense for your risk management goals, all right? So uh, we'll say that right now, that December 21 futures are trading at 450. And then we go out and we see that I could buy a put at a $4 strike price. So that gives me the right to sell at $4 anytime I'm holding that option. And that's going to cost me 15 cents a bushel. So notice that when you go to the board, uh, these are going to be premiums are quoted in price per unit. That's not just true of grain, it's true of whatever you're looking at. Premiums are quoted in price per unit, but then to know uh, how much you actually pay your broker, um, you multiply by contract size, right? So this one option would cost me $750, would give me the right to sell corn at $4 anytime I'm holding the option, or I might want to go up to $450 and notice what happens, we got a higher premium. Right, so that should, that should make sense. I'm, I'm having the right to sell at a higher price. Selling high is good, so I gotta pay for that, right? And so this option would cost $2,000. Now, how do we start to compare these? Well, an option, you know, if you think back to hedging with futures, hedging allows you to uh, have to set a target price, right? That is subject to basis risk. Well, since the, the option is only a right, not an obligation, it can set a floor, 
All right, so we're only setting the op, we're only setting a, a price target in one direction, right? So we're not cutting off the potential for upward volatility, but we're limiting the lower volatility. And so where does this floor fall? Well, I would take my strike price, I add what I expect basis to be at the time I'm marketing my grain, and then I'm going to subtract my put option premium. And I'm subtracting the premium because again, as a um, that's a cash outflow. So it's gonna set, have the same effect on my bottom line as selling at a lower price, right? So we just go ahead and do that math and say that's the, that's the uh, um, option premium, the way that's going to affect my bottom line. And then I need to subtract fees. So pay, you gotta pay the broker, right, for transactions. And this kind of varies. Uh, sometimes you, some brokers, you go ahead and you pay two transactions up front with an option. Sometimes you pay one transaction and you only pay the next if you exercise or sell it back. Um, so you want to talk to your broker about that. But definitely when you're, you're, you're thinking about um, options and planning how to use those, fees should be included. Now, since fees vary all over the board and depending on what you get from your broker and that kind of thing, we're going to skip those. But understand um, those are there, right? And, and so, so it's something you want to you want to think about. So ignoring fees, we've got our formula here for uh, an expected price floor. So we can basically set a worst case scenario for marketing. And we need to know the key to being able to predict our price floor is understanding your local basis. And so this goes back to record keeping and understanding your exact situation uh, and, and being able to predict that. And of course, things happen and basis is, is extremely hard to predict um, precisely, but the, the better you can get at that, then the more uh, useful this uh, price floor predicting is, right? And, and so understanding your local situation and what might make your basis different from somebody else's and those kind of things, um, that's very valuable. So let's say that in our example, we're expecting uh, basis to be 20 cents. All right, so futures are gonna be 20 cents um, above in uh, December, all right? And so if we go through our calculations up here, a $4 strike so gives me this approximate price floor of 365 a bushel. All right. And then the higher premium gives me a higher price floor. And so you would look at that and, and say, OK, you know, what's the trade off here? Obviously, if I want to to establish a higher price floor, I got to pay more for that. And so that premium is gone. Do you know where do the where do my trade offs fall? Which one better fits my goals? But we look at these two uh, strike prices and the uh, approximate price floors they're going to establish and then go forward. Now, how does this work? Uh, why do we, we go through that little bit of math and say that's the price floor? So, so let's talk about how that would actually play out. All right, a couple specific examples. So we move ahead to, to, to a harvest and we've got the corn to sell. And now the cash market is saying $3.50 a bushel. All right, and we get the basis prediction exactly right. All right, we get the basis prediction exactly right. And that means that that December corn futures price is at 370. All right, so I can go out and sell at 350, futures price is at 370. Well, remember, if I had a $4.50 strike, then what could I do? I could say, all right, time to exercise this put option, go out and I get my short position at $4.50, in the futures market, right? Immediately um, go back and sell at $3.70. I'm sorry, go back and buy at $3.70, right? So sell minus buy. I sold high, I bought low. I made 80 cents a bushel, all right? So I, I've made 80 cents a bushel, but remember I had to pay to play. So I had to pay 40 cents a bushel, right? To, to have that. So we've got the cash price that I actually receive. 
we've got the gain on the option, and then we've got the price that I had to pay, and I land on $3.90 a bushel, just like I planned, all right? And so that's worst case, right? Uh, my option's paying off, that's worst case scenario. One more time, this assumes that I can predict the basis, right? So I, I predicted a 390 cash floor, a uh, price floor, and that's what I got. Okay. Uh, some people, I, I like these payout charts and some people prefer to think about it like this. And so what this chart tells us is here across the bottom is where corn price, cash price could have fallen, right? So way down to $3 up to $5. And again, we're assuming that my basis is exactly right. So if, if we're looking at a $4 corn uh, cash price, that means that, um, Futures is at 420. Okay, so we're, we're saying the basis is exactly right. The tan line here is uh, unhedged cash sale. And so that one's a pretty simple one, right? It, it's a, just a one to one. If cash price is at 325, I sell at 325, right? The option isn't that simple because the option might pay off or it might not pay off. Now, Anytime that price is going to be above 430, and that means price is above four, that, that means futures is above 450, I don't exercise my option, right? I don't exercise my option. And so the, the outcome is I'm having a net price that's 40 cents less per bushel than unhedged. So basically, I lose my premium and that's all. All right. But notice I still, still benefit right, from this upward mobility, this upward volatility. I'm not cutting off the upward, the potential for upward price movement. I'm just, I've got this wedge in between my price and unhedged price because of my premium. Now, what about the other side there? Well, in these cases, just like in the previous example, the option pays off, right? So the option has some value, I exercise it. And notice the way it works, right? The, the farther down um, these uh, cash prices and by extension futures prices get, the bigger that value of the option, right? So it always offsets, right? It always offsets and that's where the price floor comes from. And so again, I like these payout charts. You can decide um, if, if they make sense or not, but that's there in the PowerPoint. Um, so wherever we're falling on the, on the chart there, that's how the option is going to affect, all right? Upward mobility is still allowed, but the downward volatility is cut off, okay? Um, another one here, I will not go through in, in as much detail, but same idea, right? We've got a, 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 the same cash price and uh, same futures price, but this time I, I had the $4 strike price. Uh, it had a lower premium and uh, it also had a lower value, right? By the time I exercised it because that, that strike price was lower. So this one, let me set the $3.65 uh, price floor. And since I got basis prediction right, that's exactly what I expected, okay? Um, same graph there. Again, I don't think uh, we'll, but well, I guess, yeah, one thing to notice there, the price wedge, right, between my unhedged and uh, hedged price is smaller because the premium's smaller. And then uh, the option protection kicks in at a lower price, right, because of the lower uh, strike, right? So it works the same, mechanics are exactly the same. Uh, but the price floor that's established is different, okay? All right, and then one more graph here from, from these two options. And basically, uh, oh, I just wanna get all this up there at the same time. Basically, uh, what this shows us is the two options that we've got, right? And so here, uh, the, the kind of bright blue line is my higher strike, right? And so notice the benefit is that I get a higher price floor. Uh, my lower strike gives me a lower price floor, right? So in the bad times, the bad times, I get my higher price floor, but 
look at if it's good times, right? It costs me more than the $4 put, right? So, it, so again, if you think about this, just like insurance, right? If you think about low deductible insurance, premium is higher, right? So you pay a bigger premium. So as long as you're not needing your insurance, you, you're, you're out the higher premium. But when you do need your insurance, it kicks in quicker, right? So the, the higher strike is kind of your high, de, uh, low deductible insurance. The lower strike is kind of your high deductible insurance, right? You're at a smaller premium, but it's going to, it's going to take a worse condition for that to kick in. Um, the basis I keep referring to there is uh, if we are off in ba basis prediction by five cents, then our price floor prediction will be off by the same amount. All right. And so we've got this case here in the, in the middle where that we get basis right. We predicted it was um, 20 under. It is and then we get our price floor exactly right, okay? We get our price floor exactly right if we end up with a stronger basis. So cash is higher relative to futures, right? So the, we're, we're talking about basis here. Stronger basis, then you get a pleasant surprise. You get a higher price floor than you, than you anticipated. Weaker basis, a lower price floor. So same concept as short hedging with futures contracts, right? A stronger basis means a uh, better outcome for the bottom line, weaker basis, a worse outcome from the bottom line for the bottom line. But notice in, in any case, you still get the protection from downward volatility in prices, right? You still get the protection. It's just that you, you might not lock in the exact price floor that, that you wanted to, right? So it's all subject to your ability to predict basis, okay? All right, so that's there as a reminder of that. And then we'll go through um, the other side of this and we'll do this one a little bit more quickly, but uh, you could also, if you're looking to buy corn, then you could do the same thing, right? You could go out and instead of using a put, now you wanna use a call. So maybe we're sitting here, um, it's March, and I'm thinking I need to buy corn out in, in June or something like that. Uh, well, you could go ahead and buy a call right now and hedge the price risk of that upcoming purchase, okay? So what if we were doing the same thing for December corn? We'd go out and we would look at the call strikes and then the call premiums, okay? Those are going to be different. And uh, again, deciding which one of those matches your, your price risk management goals. Uh, the math for, for the predicted price ceiling in this case is the same as for the price floor. We're just switching the signs around, right? So as a buyer, you want to protect yourself against upward price volatility and an, a call option lets you cut that off, right? If prices go down, you still have a bit, you still have a potential to benefit from that by paying a lower price for your input, right? So you're not, you're not cutting off volatility in both directions with a call hedging the purchase, you're cutting off that upward volatility. So we take a strike price, at expected basis, okay, that gets us to cash. And then we're going to add the call option premium. And the, the intuition here is just that paying a cash outlay has the same effect on my bottom line as paying a higher price for inputs. And so in that case, we need to add the premium, okay? Uh, fees matter, same discussion as before. And then the way that this is going to work out is we've got these price ceilings, right? That we can predict. Uh, so for example, if I've got a 450 strike, I'm expecting the 20 cent basis again, I had to pay 45 cents a bushel for this. Then as I walk through that, I could land, I, I would expect 
a price ceiling of $4.75 a bushel. So worst case scenario, the net price that I pay for my corn would be $4.75 a bushel. And I'm going to realize that protection, that ceiling subject to my ability to predict the basis, okay? All right, and then another payout chart, uh, because again, I like the payout charts. So I drew several of those, but we've got a situation here where we've got the $4.50 um, call option. So anytime, anytime that cash price is below 430 with a 20 cent basis, that means futures is below 450. It makes no sense to exercise my call option. I let it expire. I'm out my premium, right? Just like we talked about in the other example. And so now I've got this upward wedge between my price and what I would have paid uh, unhedged. All right, so this is, I paid my insurance premium, but I didn't have to use my insurance. And then the other side of that is once price starts going up, it makes sense to exercise my call and I would do that, right? And I would realize this price floor of 475. Now I'm not going to go through a table on this one, but same idea, if I'm off a penny predicting basis, then I'm off a penny predicting my uh, price ceiling. All right, so we've, we've knocked off that upward price volatility, still have some, uh, some potential to benefit from downward price volatility, and we've paid the premium to do that. Um, this is just comparing those two. And again, you can see uh, a lower price ceiling, right? So a lower price ceiling is going to come at a higher price. Right, so this is my low deductible insurance. Uh, the higher price ceiling comes at a lower price. So my high deductible insurance, right? I pay a lower price, but it doesn't kick in until the situation's a little bit worse. Okay, so uh, you can look at those charts. Like I said, hopefully that, that's helpful to kind of think about over the uh, several different price outcomes, what might happen. I wanna wrap up with just some general thoughts here on using options and risk management in general. And so if you're thinking about options and you wanna you know, stay sane and, and that kind of thing, I would really suggest before doing this, you, you kind of convince yourself to have this insurance mentality like I've talked about already. Um, you know, 2020, I paid my house insurance premiums. And uh, when 2020, went away and we rolled over to 2021, I was not at all disappointed that I didn't have to use my home insurance, right? I was not at all disappointed that we didn't have a fire or flood or something like that. I wanted that insurance in case I needed it, but just because I didn't use it, I don't go back and say, well, I wasted all those premiums, right? Same thing with options. They're there if you need them, right? And if you don't have to use them, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Hedging with options, just like with futures, means being offset. And you may decide only to hedge part of your crop or part of your purchase, and, and that's fine. Uh, but realize that uh, if your option position is greater than your cash position, right, then you're depending some on, on what's happening in the futures market. You're basically speculating a little bit in the futures market. If your cash position is bigger than your futures position, your option position, then you're speculating in the cash market. And that's perfectly fine, right? But you need to realize that's what's happening. So, so whatever bushels you want hedged, those need to be exactly offset uh, in the futures market. Exercise versus sell. You wanna spend some time talking to your broker about this. Um, if you exercise, Right. If you exercise, then you are you have a futures market position. If you don't immediately get out of that, you have a margin call, right? Or you have a margin requirement, not a margin call, because now you have a futures uh, position, right? With an option, there's no margin requirement. It's buying an option, there's no margin requirement. But once you exercise it and you're in a futures position, 
there's now a margin requirement, right? And it could also be, so it, it might be that it's simpler just to sell your option back, right? You'd pay probably one less transaction fee if you did it that way. So you'd want to compare, right? If I sell my option back at the current market premium, what does that do for me? If I go through the steps of exercising and offsetting, what does that do for me, right? So, so one's a little bit simpler than the other. And it's, it, it takes some, yeah, it takes some uh, planning there. Expiration, we talked about, grains are deliverable. So uh, options expire before contract month. And so, and again, if you exercise that option, you're in a futures position. So all the margin requirements and whatever um, kick in there. So if, if you're exercising the option, you really wanna offset that immediately. Um, to avoid some of those problems. And so those are sort of the, the quick uh, ideas, uh, mechanics of, of using a put and using a call uh, for grain sale and grain purchase. So um, wrap up right there. And I think the plan is if you have some questions specifically about what I've talked about, uh, put those out there and we can talk about those for a few minutes. And then we're gonna transition over to the next part and then I'll also be around for the rest of the session if something else comes up. So, Rich, do we have questions? Brian, there's uh, some in the chat there. <laughs> uh, Dan answered the first one in the okay. chat to Renee, but there's one from Jason, Jason, and then Dan himself had one for you towards okay. the bottom. All right, let's see. Jason, all right. How would you suggest a cow-calf producer hedge feed costs? Would you use corn futures if you're feeding more roughage or may not feed enough corn to meet a contract bushel? Uh, that's a really good question. So that, that goes back to what, what would be your preference. So um, one thing to think about is, is if corn prices are extremely uh, correlated with roughage prices, if they're moving in the same uh, direction all the time, then you, you're, you're able to, to at least partially offset those, right? So if you were over hedged, is kind of a term I don't really like, but I guess that's what I'll use. So if you're only gonna buy 2000 bushels of corn, but you've got a 5,000 bushel contract, right? Like you're saying you're over hedged by 3000 bushel. Well, if that corn contract corn price moves with the roughage price, then you're at least partially offsetting your price risk there. So that would be one way to think about it. It's not going to be as, as close as corn to corn, but it, it could be uh, helpful. Um, you know, then from there it would just be what you would prefer if you wanted to go the mini contract route. Those are a little bit odd. Uh, prices move basically with the, the full contracts, but they're not exactly the same. And they're, they're, the markets are a little bit thinner. So you get some... You, you get some weird price movements every now and then, but the mini contract is out there. That would be something to think about. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that, that kind of, if that helps or not, but that's what I would think about is, is would the corn position offset some of that roughage price risk? If so, then being over hedged uh, wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Uh, or would it, would you be better off if you, if you have another way to manage your roughage price risk, maybe forward contract or buy in advance or something like that, then maybe consider a mini contract and get more uh, toward the, the exact bushels of corn that you need. Uh, if, that, if that's not clear or something else, uh, just shoot, uh, send another chat. And then we've got one from Dan. Uh, what's your opinion on buying lower cost out of the money puts as grain producers, especially as these higher uh, grain buying lower cost out of the money puts. Yeah, Brian, yeah, I, uh, sorry to hit, hit you with that one, but uh, okay. I know even the examples we're gonna talk about next, you know, they'll, they're at the money, uh, uh, but especially say on soybeans, uh, you know, they're pretty pricey at the money, 80, 90 cents yeah. or more, mm -hmm. uh, 40, 50 for a new crop uh, corn. So yeah. I, I, I wouldn't doubt if people are looking at some cash flow issues at these high levels right. yeah. that, you know, um, there are there are benefits from paying less mm -hmm. cash flow wise, but you're losing something, too. So how, how do you view that, especially coming over from the livestock side, seeing this in the grains? How, how does a livestock producer view our grain issues with with uh, puts and calls? 
Yeah, I mean, this is really a good question. And I guess my answer won't be all that satisfying. I think it really does depend on your risk management goals and your, your risk management attitude. So again, if you've got a situation where you absolutely need uh, to know your, your price floor, you know, to be able to cover whatever your debt, debt expenses and those kind of things. So kind of the cash flow issue on that end, you need to know, you know, a, a price floor, then yeah, the higher price, the higher premiums might be worth it because that's going to keep you in business, right? If you're thinking below a cash, certain floor is catastrophic, then yeah, it makes more sense to pay the higher premium. If you're thinking, you know, I can absorb some of that this year, then it'd be just like the person, like I said, who, who goes with the high deductible insurance. You say, I can take a hit. And so fine, if it's good times, then I'm only out that, that little bit of a premium, but I know if it's a bad time, I can absorb the hit. So again, I know that that's probably a, a typical academic answer, but I do think thinking about your specific, uh, your specific operation, what would be a catastrophe for you and what you can live with and then kind of kind of go from there. I really like the, uh, that you put it in the framework of a, of a lower versus a higher deductible that, you know, we, we can intuitive, intuitively relate to that. And uh, yeah. yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, how much, how much can you give, uh, you know, mm -hmm. before, how, how much can you uh, afford to put at risk and how much can you absolutely not, <laughs> that's right. you know? Yeah. And uh, so that, that'd be a good way to apply the thought. And I, and I do think in, in risk management, a lot of times uh, when we put our stuff out there, you know, as academics, a lot of times we're thinking about average and, 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 and those kind of things. And I do think, you know, in the real world, you, you got to think about the one off events that might really, you know, just end things for you. So, if, if, you know, your 10 year average doesn't matter if year two is so bad, you can't go on. So, so I think that's another, another way to, yeah, another reason that's important.